We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Lit podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. My name is Christy Shriver. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Live podcast. Today, we finish our discussion of Mary Shelley's classic horror tale, Frankenstein. This is the fourth and the final episode in discussion, and we certainly have been all over the place in terms of the range of ideas she's incorporated. And looking at my notes, we're going to stretch even farther today. So let's do a little recap. In episode one, we primarily discussed Mary Shelley, her life, and the influences that helped create the context for the novel. In episode two, we go through the letters that precede chapter one and set up the narrative structure. In fact, we discuss the three narratives that help create this unusual frame story structure. We discuss the setting of Geneva and one of its favorite sons, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose ideas are very heavily outlined in this book. We also talk about the science of the day, galvanism, and the current events that were affecting everyone's understanding of electricity. Then at the end of the episode, we discuss the creation of the monster itself and Victor's bizarre reaction to what he had made. Last week, we got around to exploring the feminist criticism that's always circulated and evolved greatly since people uh, have been reading this famous novel written by a woman. We laid out the most common highlights as far as what critics have brought out over the years as to the gender politics surrounding the novel. Then we arrived at a third narrative where the monster finally gets a voice. We discuss albeit not as deeply as we would have liked, some of the broad ideas that Shelley brings out through the monster's experiences, the family he stalks, and the books that he reads. We finally land at Milton's Paradise Lost and how the monster interprets his existence through this theological and social lens. We discuss how the monster sees himself as a victim, a person born good, desiring good, and capable of great good, who turned out evil out of necessity, we see that he views himself as Adam and Victor as God. But then at the end, we see that the monster also identifies with Satan. He sees himself capable of great revenge, but not just revenge, great evil. And I think that's where we left off. Yes. You left that one thing, though, uh, and all of this was a setup. This whole dialogue was a setup on the monster's part. He's not just Satan in the capacity to do great evil. He's also Satan in the capacity to have great seduction. This entire monologue serves only one purpose. He wants something. He wants sympathy, but more than that, he wants something specific. And he's willing to promise all sorts of things to get exactly what he wants. Oh, (laughs) yes, he does. And the thing is, he wants Victor to make him a female monster, a companion. Yes. And it's here in chapter 17. That's where we're starting today, where we are faced with this Rousseau question again, as to the nature of man. Who is good? Are we all good? Are we not? Is the monster good? Is Victor a good person? And Shelley has not made it easy for us, although she forces us into this conversation in our heads, not even to decide what constitutes a good person. If you can make a person good, are they naturally good? And then can you make a person evil? And if they're an evil person, can you change them back into good? Is there fluidity between the two? And she creates an array of perfect people in this story. Every single person in Victor's world is practically perfect. Elizabeth, his mother, his father, Clerval, Justine, they're all perfect. But 
that's not really who we're interested in when we read the book. Actually, they're not even real. They're not even very relatable, really. We are talking about the narrators. Even Walton is at the heart of the thematic discussion, but really, truly, we're talking about Victor and the monster. So Victor, you see, was created in this perfect Garden of Eden place. He has a perfect background. And in a sense, he takes his power from God, he usurps it, and he creates life. He makes a creature. But does he make a good creature? Is even Victor, for all of his perfect upbringing, is he actually good to begin with? Uh, That's a good question, and a question all of us have asked about ourselves is probably one of the deepest intuitive feels that people feel when they read the book. They begin to question what's good and bad. So are we good? Are we making good things with our lives? Uh, It's a great place for all of us to find ourselves in the story. For sure. And then we have to add in the title of the book. The book's called Frankenstein, A Modern Prometheus. Now, what did Prometheus do? the Greek Prometheus. He defied Zeus. He defied God after he made man. He defied God when he stole fire at great personal cost. But why did he do it? He did it for man because he seemed to see himself as having a responsibility towards man. And so he created civilization. This is basically what the monster is asking Victor to do by creating a woman, create a civilization, take a responsibility. And his argument is interesting because now he's going to fall back on this concept of justice. He's going to say, ethically, you must do this. If you're going to be a good person, you owe it to me. (laughs) Interesting point of view to have. Anyway, uh, and, and I can imagine that most readers of this book at this point totally agree with this line of reasoning. And in fact, most of us look at good versus bad as either or virtues that define people's essence, which is really actually kind of a childlike way to do it, to split things into all good or all bad. Uh, You know, if, if you're a good person, then you're not a bad person. If you're bad, you're not good. So you find yourself asking for the rest of the book, is Victor or isn't Victor a good person? Is the monster evil or is he not evil? But then you have this other layer of complexity. Uh, and I think complexity is a very important word here because it's independent of good and evil and rights. And of course, our American legal system would say that, that all of us have human rights. So if we're going to look at the monster as human, and that's another question, but if we agree just for the moment that the monster has even the most basic of human rights, well, I mean, then surely he's owed something. Surely he's owed the most basic of human rights, which is fellowship into the community of man. I mean, human morality or our idea of reciprocity demands something here. Uh, doesn't he deserve something for being alive? As Shelley brings out on the title page, he didn't ask for life. It was given to him against his will. And the language the monster uses here is is all about right and wrong. He says, I demanded of you as a right which you must not refuse me. True. And perhaps that's why Shelley qualifies her title. And she, she doesn't say Frankenstein the Prometheus. She says Frankenstein, a modern Prometheus. So Prometheus thought he had an obligation to humans. Uh, he actually sacrifices himself completely. I mean, his fate was horrible for humanity. But is his modern counterpart the same? Does the modern Prometheus really view himself with the kind of responsibility toward his creative being? Uh, Because he doesn't. He flat out says, I do refuse it. I will never consent. So, is he right? Well, the creature has an opinion about that. I mean, he comes back with the argument, you are wrong I am malicious because I am miserable. That's true. He says, am I not shunned and hated by all mankind? You, my creator, would tear me to pieces in triumph. Remember that and tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me. You would not call it murder if you could precipitate me into one of those ice rifts destroying my frame, the work of your hand. Shall I respect man when he condemns me? Let me live with me in the interchange of kindness, and instead of injury, I would bestow every benefit upon him with tears of gratitude as his acceptance. 
but that cannot be. The human senses are insurmountable barriers to our union. Yet mine shall not be submission of abject slavery. I will revenge my injuries. If I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear and chiefly towards you, my arch enemy, because my creator, do I swear inexhaustible hatred. Have a care. I will work at your destruction, nor finish until I desolate your heart so that you shall curse the hour of your birth. Hmm. Yikes. So the monster is going to land at a threat, I think. And perhaps uh, you can see it as a mere consequence for the total selfishness of the modern Prometheus that this guy has landed at this place. Or is it just a natural consequence of irresponsible action? I want to sidebar here for just a moment <laughs> okay. and talk about the monster. Because when you uh, see movie adaptations of the monster, you see a, a, a zombie-like walking, uh, bumbling, uncoordinated monster that can't articulate very well. And green. And, and green. <laughs> Mary Shelley never once tells us he's green with a flat head. Okay? But the monster in Mary Shelley's work is incredibly articulate. Look at this argument. Make. And not only that... The monster's athletic, we're going to find out. The monster's supple and strong and, and way more coordinated than Victor is. So anyway, I would just wanted to draw that contrast between the old, um, I mean, what Mary Shelley wanted and what actually shows up in the movies because um, we're getting into a really deep discussion about the nature of man with this very sophisticated mind. Yeah, I don't know why. Maybe we just prefer simplifying it so we can put it on a screen and make the difference more evident. Or maybe we just don't feel comfortable with such an eloquent monster. I don't know. That's a good, well, interesting. It's, it's the idea also that when you go to a movie, a lot of people would get lost in a rousseau like oh, that's discussion true. on the nature <laughs> of man. Your head would spin and you would leave. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's easier, more entertaining <laughs> just to see the monster do crazy stuff. So... Uh, it, here's what I find fascinating uh, is that irresponsibility really was Victor Frankenstein's hallmark from the beginning of this entire project. And if you were to pay attention to the details of when he created the monster, the text says that he created him to be so big because he found it too tedious to make things small. I mean, it was extra work to worry about the details, which of course, Obviously, it is. I mean, it was slowing down the process, and he wanted to hurry up and make his human, so he gave the fun part of giving it life. That's really not being responsible for life, or at least thinking about what you're doing. And here, after Frankenstein hears the entire tale, he considers the reasonableness of this argument. He says, I felt that there was some justice in it. But then later on, he looks at him, and he says, but when I looked upon him, I saw the filthy mass that moved and talked and my heart sickened and my feelings were altered to those of horror and hatred. I tried to stifle these sensations. I thought that as I could not sympathize with him, I had no right to withhold him the small portion of happiness which was yet in my power to bestow. So he agrees with the request. But he does not sympathize. Uh, there's not a shred of compassion. And the reader is left with another question. How is this possible? How can you not have feelings when this creature that you made, who goes around not even killing animals, he's a vegetarian, for goodness sake, tells you that all he wants is to not be alone? I mean, who's the monster in that situation? Who's good and who's evil? It's a good question because if he was really sad about it when he made it, he could have just lopped it on the head and killed it. But he lets it get up and he lets it go about. And and you you, you land at this very confusing place. And, and Shelley is never going to let you kind of find your feet on this issue, not even to the end of the book. And it's not possible. I don't know why it's not possible, but it's not possible to kind of go back and forth uh, what we want to see, is this monster good? I mean, because he does kind of do a few good things. I mean, he saves a person, he helps a family. But then all of a sudden, you're forced to vacillate to the very opposite position because it's obviously evil to kill people, especially innocent people. Uh, so why does he want to kill people? Well, you can say, well, he wants to kill people because Victor hurt him first. But then I have, that doesn't, that kind of fails the say out loud test. Is that a thing? Can you feel an innocent, kill an innocent person because somebody else uh, did a bad thing to you? Uh, are there not rules of the universe that? 
I can't speak for rules of the universe, uh, but I can speak to being psychopathic. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, that. Yeah, uh, th- this is psychopathic thinking um, to do this kind of thing. It's really devoid of. Uh, it's displaying a, a connection with compassion itself too. The fact that you deny me something I want, therefore I have the right to not just destroy everything good in your life, but terrorize you in the process. That's very Or terrorize other people that don't yes. have a connection right. uh, directly and, because it somehow it balances the universe out in my favor. Right. And we discussed this in the last episode about choices. And uh, the, these just happen to be the choices that the monster makes. And they're contrasted with the choices that Victor makes. And so... I want to say that not everyone in the world becomes evil because they're mistreated, by the way. Uh, I'd say not even the majority. There are lots of people that have experienced extreme suffering and did not turn into a monster. Thank goodness. Yeah, not even in this story is that true. I mean, Mary Shelley cleverly makes Justine, the monster's second victim, a victim herself of abuse by her own mother, and she doesn't choose evil. No, actually, she chooses to go quite the opposite way. Uh, but let's just say, just for argument's sake, that you do excuse the monster. And you're going to say, okay, it's not his fault uh, for him killing uh, uh, the brother and setting up Justine. And it's all Victor's fault. So if you land there and say, no, we're going to excuse all this behavior from the monster because he didn't mean to be evil. He was made evil. So that makes Victor evil, Right. Well, let me say this. We're belaboring this conversation at this point <laughs> because the monster's dialogue is very seductive, like you point out earlier. And many readers will walk away being very sympathetic. But by the end of chapter 17, uh, Victor is in utter despair. He weeps and he has suicidal thoughts. He apparently walks all the way down the glacier back to Geneva and into his dad's house looking like a crazy person. But still, he never tells a soul what is happening. Well, and that actually is some of the final big ideas that I think we haven't talked about yet, but, well, not much, but that are really overshadowing the whole book, even from the very beginning. This idea of remorse, secrecy, isolation, and the relationship between these three things. And that's what you see kind of going on here. Why is he so sad? Is that remorse? Is it shame? Why won't he tell his family? Well, what is the result of him isolating himself further? And he does. You would think he couldn't get more isolated, but he is going to isolate himself further and further away from the people that obviously love him. Right. And I like to point out that obviously what the monster is displaying right here is an extroverted personality. I want to be connected with another person. Uh, introverts feel that a little less intensely than than extroverts do. So I think it's interesting. It gave him that driving desire to be connected with another person. So, um, but I want to say a couple things about isolation uh, and about loneliness. Um, solitary confinement is one of the most cruel punishments out there. I mean, the, the psychological effects are immense. It can create anxiety and panic attacks and levels of paranoia. And interestingly enough, isolation can also bring on hallucinations because, uh, I mean, a lack of outside stimuli causes people to, to misattribute these internal thoughts and feelings as occurring in the outer environment. So, I mean, your own mind will, will start to go to war with you under intense isolation. Well, Shelley makes a huge point, I really think might even be the only point on the next chapter, to highlight this isolation that's going to develop inside of Victor. Because instead of marrying Elizabeth and going to a place where he can have human intimacy, he's going to actually do the exact opposite thing. He runs, and he's going to run to England. Obviously, this isn't probably healthy. His dad recognizes this and kind of recruits Clerval to go with him. But by doing that, what we get to see are these two guys side by side. One is kind of where a well of himself. He's uh, a functioning human being. And the other person uh, is isolating himself the whole time. So Clerval, the perfect counterpart, he's always happy. He gets out by himself. He's in nature, but he can soak it in. He's alone a lot of times, but he's not sad or lonely. He drinks in the beautiful landscapes of England. He makes friends everywhere. He adores everything. He's so happy and he loves everyone. Victor, 
not so much. He actually says, company was irksome to me. And he just begins to hate people and the presence of other people. And he visits these blue, beautiful places and Clerval soaks it up. And all he does is start to worry about, you know, I haven't made the monster yet. What's going to happen? It's been a long time since we had our mountain chat. And so it gets to be to the point where he ditches Clerval completely. And I do want to point out that Shelley clearly knows her geography here. I mean, she has these two go everywhere, gives very detailed descriptions of the places that they visit and how they get from place to place. They travel all over until Victor finally isolates himself on what he calls one of the remotest of the Orkneys. And quite honestly, since I've never been to Scotland, was planning to go until a little quarantine pandemic hit. <laughs> Um, I wanted to look up where this was and see what exactly was drawing Shelley to this particular spot. And I have to admit, this is a pretty impressive setting choice. First of all, the Orkneys is not just one thing. It's an archipelago, but it also contains a group of 70 islands. And of those, only 20 are inhabited. Uh, the largest, called the mainland, is a little over 200 square miles. And it's off the northernmost coast of Scotland. You can't go any farther north. And today, if you look at pictures, it's absolutely stunning. I mean, it's full of cliffs and rock features. And uh, honestly, it, it's a honeymoon destination, which apparently has a lot of incredibly good fresh food, <laughs> but not during Victor and Frankenstein's day. No, maybe it wasn't the tourist destination in the 1700s, at least not the part that he's at. Uh, but there are things about this that kind of remind me of things that you definitely would want to have and in a gothic horror scary story it's cold it's windy there's lots of waves and fog and rain classic scary horror tale stuff especially if you have to make a monster uh, but more important than that and i think this you know more than she wanted to make a place scary uh shelly has done something really interesting here and she's kind of symbolically showing all of us what isolation looks like because here he's not just emotionally isolated he's literally physically on his own initiative isolated by himself he runs away to this extreme place like he can't even find a place to get any farther except of course later on he does but anyway this place is challenging for his uh physical sense but uh he's alone well he thinks he's alone but <laughs> <laughs> he's alone. We at, know, we know. He's not alone in a creepy way. No, the monster's there. And this is where this idea, I think, monster is secret, really kind of takes on this vivid image that a lot of us can relate to. The monster is his secret, and you can run, but your secret follows you, and it's hideous and it's horrible. It is. And Victor keeping it a secret. He's connected to shame, which is an interesting concept right here. But anyway, uh, I think that everybody can relate to this and we can understand how he feels. And again, I know I keep saying this, but this is what impresses me so much with Mary Shelley. How does she write all this and know it at the age of 18? I mean, uh, psychologists can tell us that we understand the world through stories and narratives. It's how we orient ourselves and are able to kind of sort out our decisions. We think it's by deductive reasoning or lining up pros and cons and being rational, but a lot of times it's not. We really see the world as a story. So let's just look at this book as a way of kind of fleshing this idea out. One way to see what I'm talking about is looking at this book as a framework to understanding addiction which I know many people have done, and critics have written extensively about this. Uh, in fact, and we really don't have time to go too far down this path, but it's a very interesting, especially in the context where addiction is a contemporary cultural hot topic. Uh, so at this time in history in England, as well as in America, drug use, especially in the crowd that Shelley ran with, was a huge thing. I mean, Lord Byron used them. Uh, Percy Shelley was a drug user. Everyone in the arch crowd was, even Charles Dickens during that time period. I mean, drugs were not illegal and a lot less taboo, and they were common. And until 1868, you could get them anywhere. No one really knew about this drug addiction. It's not a thing. Well, ironically, uh, 
it's funny you bring that up. In the next chapter, Victor is going to have to take a couple of hits of laudamine himself, the, <laughs> drug. the drug of choice yeah. of their day, because he's got all this anxiety and he wants to take the edge off of it after Clerval's death. Well, if you want to look at the book through this lens, and that's a very modern way of looking at it, I want to say, I want to qualify that. What we see beautifully illustrated is the isolating effects a person's addiction can have and the sheer power of the secret one is forced to create because of the addiction. I mean, in Victor's case, and just pretend that the monster represents addiction, he keeps his addiction secret at all costs. Even though it causes him to lose family members, he holds on to his secret. He lets people die. He lets other people take blame. But all the time feeling feeling more and more responsible, more and more trapped, more and more alone, bargaining with the addiction, but ultimately finding himself in a place where he is absolutely alone, except with the addiction. I think this is one of those places where readers can really relate with Shelley. Uh, addiction is just one example, but it's a good one. I mean, there are things, secrets that we keep, and we hate ourselves for keeping them, but we have reasons we can't let go of. And we watch ourselves being destroyed by some monster. Well, funny you should bring that up because one thing that I played around with talking about, and I can't really figure out how to put it in here without just sounding like it's off topic, is the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is this poem that Shelley is going to create off and on throughout this whole story that was written by another romantic author named Samuel Coleridge who openly struggled with addiction, and he wrote about it and a lot of things. But see, people have talked about it in connection to the poem uh, that she quotes a lot, and I we don't really have time to go down that trail. But if you're one of these poor saps that's been saddled with writing a paper on this book, one thing that I think would be interesting to to read up about and understand is the connection between the poem, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and the things that she uses it to talk about in the, in the novel. And addiction, I think, may be one of those things. But anyway, back on track. By chapter 20, that's where we're at, it's been three years since Victor first makes the monster. And now we're ready for monster number two. Except it doesn't happen. <laughs> and I'm going to resist the temptation to get back into gender politics, but it's a natural place to do so because his reasoning, why he says he's not going to make this, has everything to do with gender politics. He's going to say, well, women have this power of reproduction. And if he makes a woman, he'll end up making a race of devils. <laughs> well, if we were to remove the gender politics, I mean, isn't this still a fair assumption? He is a scientist. He does understand reproduction, don't you think? Yes, sure enough. But it is about time he started thinking about the ramifications of his actions, something that hasn't occurred to him over the last hmm. three years. <laughs> it seems when he thinks about making a woman, uh, that triggers some of these thoughts that he probably should have had the first time he wanted to make a monster. The prom monster promised to be good, but then he thinks in the context of the woman, well, what if the woman doesn't want to be good? She has free uh, will. Who is going to control her? And he goes down this road and it's a slippery slope until he finally lands at this place. And he said, oh, I could be responsible for the end of the human race. So he will feel guilty about that, but not about the death of yes. his loved ones. Well, I mean, the end of the race is a bad thing. You don't want to be responsible for that. But anyway, he looks at it uh, and he looks up from that monster that he's creating. And then he sees the living one looking at him, grinning. And what it says frightens him more than looking at the monster grinning is in his face, he sees malice and treachery. And when he looks at that monster with this expression in his face, he makes a decision. It's an emotional decision, but it is a definitive one. And he tears up the girl right before the monster's eyes. Hmm, and that is not well received. <laughs> no, it's not received well at all. First of all, there's a lot of howling. But then uh, we come back to this intellectual tangle that uh, the monster is going to get into. And it's kind of some of the more famous phrases that uh, we know in the story. A lot of people have heard these lines even out of context of the book. You want to read them? Sure. 
You can blast my other passions, but revenge remains. Revenge, henceforth, dearer than light or food. I may die, but first you, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. I will watch with the wiliness of a snake that I may sting with its venom. Man, you shall repent of the injuries you inflict. And then finally, he ends with these foreboding lines. It is well, I go, but remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> a little invasive. Well, every smart reader who reads these lines, you're, the first thing you're going to do is imagine various scenarios of what could he possibly mean. But Victor, being Victor, only has one interpretation in mind. And he says this, In that hour, I should die, and that once satisfy and extinguish his malice. The prospect did not move me to fear. Yet when I thought of my beloved Elizabeth, of her tears and her endless sorry, which she should find her lover so barbarously snatched from her, tears, the first I had shed for months, steamed from my eyes, and I resolved not to fall before my enemy without a bitter struggle. And this just cracks me up because it's so typical Victor. He He's not afraid for his life, but she would lose him. And to lose him... <laughs> If he thinks about what it would feel like to lose him, he's moved to tears. <laughs> I, there are so many traces of narcissism that we've not developed in Victor. But, uh, oh, my gosh. So anyway, uh, he's not really, I don't know. He doesn't act to me like he's afraid of the monster. I mean, there's a couple of times in here he's actually yeah. attacked the monster. So I don't. I don't really know. Hmm. Well, clearly he should be afraid, but obviously not for himself. I mean, but getting back to isolation for a minute and revenge, uh, I think this is another place in the book where we see a lot of Mary Shelley's own possible emotions coming through. I mean, I can imagine most of us have been in a place where we felt so angry at a person, so alone in the world that we wanted to act out in this way. And the line, you shall repent of the injuries you inflict. I mean, that cuts at the heart of what we all feel when we've been deeply betrayed and all we want to do is lash back, except most of us don't actually act out those impulses. Yeah, there's a lot of emotion, a lot of relatable emotion there. And when you're a small uh, woman, I can attest to that being five feet and one half inch. <laughs> you know, this idea <laughs> you that exaggerate. Yeah, I could be this anonymous eight foot monster and inflict my revenge. That's a fantasy uh, that, of course, would make people maybe feel a little relief. But anyway, Victor is going to, at this place, tosses the girl's monster body parts into the ocean and kind of is done with all this and somehow manages to fall asleep in a boat and roll across the way to Ireland. Another setting hmm. in the book. <laughs> right, and I find Ireland, again, to be a very interesting choice. I mean, of course, we know Shelley spent time in Scotland, so that makes sense. But Ireland brings in another historical angle that's worth a little sidebar. Why do you say that? I think it's great that the uh, Irish, I love this part, because they're the only ones that don't, like, fall head over heel in love with Victor. In fact, they slap his <laughs> rear end in jail, and they're mean to him. And ironically... Uh, they say that he's guilty, and we know that he is. <laughs> yes, yes, they have the insight, okay? <laughs> True, but, but what's interesting to me about this choice of setting is the obvious political antagonism that existed during this time period between the British and the Irish. I mean, at this time, Ireland was under British domination, and you know where there's colonization, there's resentment towards the colonizers and racism towards the people of the colony, and that's no exception. I mean, during Shelley's lifetime, there was extreme prejudice against the Irish from the British. In fact, and this is just a horrible term, Irish Frankenstein is actually a thing. If you Google it, you'll see a large quantity of political cartoons that portray Irish people as loafs and stupid and uncultured, backwards, uh, lower level, sometimes even psychopathic people. And by modern standards, we find it really appalling. And today you would never see anything like that in commercial media. And I would like to put in a plug for my Irish ancestry right here, but go ahead. <laughs> Well, in a sense, I guess you can say that when Shelley sends Victor to Ireland, she's 
isolating him even more. Like you're not even just going to the vast ends of the world. You're beyond that. You're going to live with undesirable people, bad society, out of fashion. What can be worse than the Orkneys? Ireland. (laughs) Mm. So I think an English person at that time period might see it that way. An English reader, that is. They would certainly say he's fallen from the great heights of a polished, fancy medical school to being in jail by people they find beneath them. Well, he's far from home. His best friend is dead. His brother, his brother's nanny is dead. His career is dead. And this is the first time we really see Victor, because he's in jail, he's exposed to any consequences of an outside nature. I know he's had all this internal suffering, but right. an th- actual consequence. I, showing that sooner or later... You cannot run from the consequences of a lie, and he is completely living a lie. And this is, of course, where we see in the book, Leaving Ireland, that he gets into the drugs. He can't get to sleep, so it's an unnatural reality. So what is he going to do? He's going to take a double portion of laudamen because he needs to get away, and he can't get away physically, so he's going to try to get away in his mind, but instead of drug-induced sleep, he gets a drug-induced nightmare hmm. where the monster is strangling him. That's kind of, now we're in chapter 22, Victor's father and he are traveling back on their way to Geneva, and we're going to catch them as they hit through Paris, and I like this place in the book because, again, we get to hear a different voice. We get to hear the voice of Elizabeth through a letter where she basically confronts Victor for his lack of romantic interest in her, which I kind of think has stood out from the very beginning. There's not a lot of romantic dialogue coming from his part. Yeah. Basically, she says, I understand you can say what you want. I, I think you might have another love interest. That's fine. Just let me know. And it's really a sweet, true, truly loving letter because she does want what's best for them, for him, not even just for her, but for him. And although she feels zero reciprocity, he gives nothing back to her. She continues to give with him, to to him. So as with all of his relationships, actually, he does this kind of stuff. He takes, but he doesn't give back. And it's going on far beyond what she should obviously accept. And it's her decision to stick with him. And we're going to see that there's a consequence to that. Hmm. Of course, there are obvious social reasons. And Shelley makes sure to make those obvious for Elizabeth's choice here. And I think even an 18th century reader would see the irony inherent in this letter. There's no way not to be entirely sympathetic for Elizabeth at this point, because, I mean, even Victor's father finds him deranged. And here, if we look at the two main characters, we have to ask ourselves, the monster is obviously bad because he hurts people, but Victor hurts people even if it is covert and less obvious. So the question is, are they more similar than they would initially appear? Well, that is the question. And what happens next in this book absolutely highlights and heightens that question because they're going to return to Geneva. Victor and Elizabeth marry, uh, although he does express the fact that he notices she's lost a lot of her beauty since he last saw her smug. (laughs) But they marry. He marries her in spite of her lack of beauty. And he promises this. He says, I'll tell you my secret the day after our wedding. And so then they take off across the lake and we're back into Gothop world. It's dark. Of course, it's going to rain. They get to this spooky spot. And when they get there, Victor leaves Elizabeth alone, presumably to walk up and down the house looking for the monster. But at this point in the book, I don't even know if I believe that. I find myself trusting him less and less. But regardless, he's out there walking around and then he hears a shrill and dreadful scream. That's the words in the book, a shrill and dreadful scream. And of course we know, he knows, she's dead. And if you look, there's the grasp of the monster on her neck. And what I find the next level of kind of icky is the monster sticks around and he watches Victor 
And he grins at Victor, and he points to the dead body. Hmm, a little bit more psychopathic behavior there. (laughs) Yeah, it's getting worse. And, and of course, now, after all these people die, Victor finally feels the surge of hate and revenge that the monster has been describing for a long time. I mean, we see Victor speak of revenge, and we see Victor finally take some initiative. He goes to the magistrate and wants to hunt the monster down. I mean, that is something we haven't seen at all regarding any of the other deaths in the book. I know, and I kind of find that hard to understand. Why now? He doesn't seem to love Elizabeth any more than anybody else that has died. So what's the difference? I can speculate, but it seems like Victor finally breaks. If you want to say like father, like son, the monster's like Victor, except he didn't have any of this social structure, the culture, or the emotional ability to contain himself. So he broke pretty much immediately, like a child would, although not immediately. But Victor is broken, and we see him sound now a lot like the monster. I mean, he speaks of despair and then rage, and these have been the controlling emotions of the monster from the beginning. I mean, listen to these quotes, and these are not from the monster. They're from Victor Let the cursed and hellish monster drink deep of agony. Let him feel the despair that now torments me. Well, it's the end of the novel, and these two are alone in the world. Victor's father dies of heartbreak when he finds out about Elizabeth, and Victor does what Victor does. He leaves again. He leaves his only surviving brother to go follow his obsession, and he's going to venture out and pursue the monster. For months. And of course, in terms of if this was physically possible, it gets a bit unbelievable, but we're not <laughs> going to hold anybody to that. They, anyway, they're going to end up with their dog sleds. And this is where we started with the book. They're up in the North Pole and we're back to Walton writing about this to his sister. And it's kind of a strange dynamic because we feel ourselves being reminded that this is a letter within a letter and that we've been kind of pushed out of the story. We're pushed away from the, from the action. And when this happens, what Shelley does is she kind of frees us up to look at these two characters a little more objectively. I think you're not in the story so much with them. And we can kind of see, I mean, I can kind of see that these two characters running around the North Pole are kind of very similar, even if one is a serial killer. <laughs> and, and like Walton, we can ask ourselves, you know, Ugh, how close am I to making a monster out of what I'm doing? Or how close am I making myself into a monster? And I don't know, and this is kind of a, um, an opinion, but I kind of think that's what makes Frankenstein so popular from generation to generation, even though the science is kind of hokey and outdated and the language is so difficult to read. But Shelley has kind of shown us that perhaps, you know, there isn't such a big difference between a good person and a bad person. Like she's been playing around in our minds throughout this entire book. And she asks us to ask ourselves, you know, are you capable of good? Yes. Are you capable of evil? Yes. Are you capable of making somebody else evil? And you have to say, probably so. Yeah, and again, it's a very complex look at humans. They're not black and white, they're gray. And she honestly expresses how it feels to be that person who's rejected. And many of us know how that feels. I mean, how does it feel to be cruelly neglected, pushed away, and stolen from in deep and personal ways? I mean, the pain of the monster is one of the strongest sentiments in the book, and we understand it. What I find interesting in the way she ends the book is that in some ways the monster doesn't hate Victor. He resents him, but he doesn't hate him. He follows him. He allows Victor to follow him. I mean, he maintains the connection until the very end. And it's really only after Victor dies that he reaches again to connect to another human being. And in this connection, this time, to Walton, uh, and it's not to murder anyone. No, it is to express the last emotion of the book. And this is a book that's full of emotion. But the last emotion that she's going to land on is remorse. And she does this kind of on the last pages. And she says this. You who call Frankenstein your friend seem to have a knowledge of my crimes and his misfortunes, but in the detail which he gave you of them, he could not sum up the hours and months of misery which I endured wasting in impotent passions. 
For while I destroyed his hopes, I did not satisfy my own desires. They were even more ardent in craving. Still I desired love and fellowship, and I was still spurred. Was there no justice in this? Am I to be thought the only criminal who all humankind sinned against me? Why do you not hate Felix, who drove his friend from his door with contumely? Why do you not execrate the rustic who sought to destroy the savior of his child? Nay, those are virtuous and immaculate beings. I, the miserable and abandoned, am I an abortion to be spurned at and kicked and trampled on? Even now my blood boils at the recollection of this injustice. But it is true that I am a wretch. I have murdered the lovely and the helpless. I have strangled the innocent as they slept and grasped to death his throat who never injured me or any other living being. I have devoted my creator, the select specimen of all that is worthy of love and admiration among men, to misery. I have pursued him even to that irredeemable ruin. There he lies, white and cold in death. You hate me, but your abhorrence cannot equal that with which I regard myself." He goes on to say, Fear not that I shall be the instrument of future's mischief. My work is nearly complete. Neither yours nor any man's death is needed to consummate the series of my being and accomplish that which must be done, but it requires my own. Do not think I shall be slow to perform the sacrifice. I shall quit your vessel on the ice raft which brought me hither and shall seek the most northern extremity of the globe. I shall collect my funeral pile and consume the, to ashes this miserable frame that it remains may afford no light to any curious or unhallowed wretch who would create such another as I have been. I shall die. And he goes on to say, I should have wept to die. Now it is my only consolation, polluted by crimes and torn by the bitterness remorse. Where can I find rest but in death? The monster does express remorse over what he has done. And we just read, he wants to kill himself. And then, of course, at the end of the book, what does he do? He jumps out the window and he goes away. So do you think he's really going to do it? Oh, uh, that's a good <laughs> question. And Mary Shelley won't answer for us. And by the way, this is how you leave it wide open for a sequel. Not, <laughs> not that there is one, but in modern days. It could be. It. Uh, I, I guess it wouldn't be horror if the monster couldn't at any time come through our window on a cold and stormy night. But honestly, I'm left with the feeling that he is going to go kill himself. I know, and it's sad. This book is completely devoid of redemption. Everyone loses. Well, maybe not Walton. He's the last man standing, and he does choose to go back. But isn't this a hallmark of romanticism? <laughs> Lost, despair, emotions. And anyway, uh, but I think he is redeemed. He, like us, the readers, takes a good look at this life, and he applies the lesson of Frankenstein, and he says, I'm going home. Well, I think we can finally leave Victor and Mary, because Mary's sending us home. Whatever home means, home to our families, home to forgiveness, home to more balance between work and family, between personal ambition and travel. I guess it's kind of open-ended with only one point of agreement. We definitely do not want to be Victor Frankenstein or the monster <laughs> either one. or either one or both and, or are they even different? Right. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being with us. Uh, it's been a great journey looking at Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Be sure and follow us on Instagram and Facebook and check out our How to Love Lit podcast page. But the most important thing, tell your friends about our podcast. Thanks for being with us. Peace out. <laughs> <laughs>